Tracy woke up in a cold sweat once again, her heart beating fast with fear. She turned her head to look at the alarm clock, an old relic from the past that she inherited from her grandmother, and groaned. The hour hand pointed to three o'clock in the morning and fifteen minutes. Always the same time. Tracy didn't believe in magic. Mermaids, vampires, unicorns, all of this seemed like fairy tales for children. However, now she was worried. It couldn't have been a coincidence. Tracy got out of bed, touching the carpet with her bare feet, and walked around as if trying to get used to reality. It's just a dream, a bad dream, the girl tried to convince herself, but she knew there was more truth in her nightmare than she wanted to admit. Unable to sleep, Tracy checked her friend list on social media and saw that her friend Viola was online. She called her immediately. What's up, Tracy? Viola asked as she picked up the phone. Did you see the time? Of course, Tracy groaned, unable to restrain herself. There was silence on the other end of the line as Viola checked her clock. Then she sighed in fear. Oh, you woke up again at that time, didn't you? Listen, maybe you should go to a psychologist. And what should I tell her? You know, I have problems with sleep. Can you tell me what Uncle Freud thinks about this? Oh no, let me give you a hint. Maybe the cause of insomnia and stress is hidden in the fact that this summer, me and my friends, Tracy started to say. Viola warned her angrily. Shh, okay, I got it, it's a bad idea. Unlike her friend, Viola believed in unicorns and phone tapping. She even covered the camera on her laptop with plaster so that agents wouldn't spy on her. What business did agents have with a second-year student? She didn't specify. Tracy was sitting on the windowsill holding the phone to her ear. She pressed her forehead against the cool glass and looked out into the dark courtyard. Listen, I have another idea. Viola said, finally. You won't like it, but don't refuse right away, okay? You know, I'll do almost anything to calm down, the girl said. Even to go to a shaman in Africa. You won't have to go that far, but you're almost right, giggled Viola. There's a fortune teller living in the Green River Village, where my parents live. She cures any illness, I swear. There are such rumours about her in the village, it's scary. They say she talks to ghosts. Oh yeah, all I need are ghosts, Tracy exclaimed in fear. I don't want to talk to anyone. I'm not suggesting that. Just ask her to get rid of your insomnia. My grandmother told me she could cure anyone. Some with advice some with medicine made from roots and berries. I believe my grandmother. She won't lie, Viola said. You have to bring her some groceries for her help. She doesn't take money. Sugar, cereals, pasta, that's okay. Tracy didn't know why she agreed to the adventure and the trip to the village, but in the morning, she stood at the bus stop next to Viola, who was chatting happily. First we'll cure you. And then we'll go to my family. My grandmother is pleased that we're coming. She's been making pies since dawn, for sure. Tracy bit her cheek from the inside, envying her best friend. She didn't understand how Viola could behave so casually after what their group of four had done. However, she didn't dare to ask. They didn't talk about it at all. So, Tracy kept a diary to share her experiences with someone. The fortune teller lived not in a gloomy hut, but in an ordinary house. However, the view from her window of the village cemetery gave it a sinister charm. The owner of the house greeted her guest and sat her on a low bench before returning to her business, cooking soup or a potion. Tracy sniffed the smell of the broth and realised that it was soup. It was unlikely that the tincture would smell like chicken broth. 
Well, tell me, what burden did you bring with you? I see it's hard for you. You're leaning towards the ground, the old woman said without turning to Tracy. A girl, afraid of speaking too much, complained to a fortune teller about her sleeplessness. I wake up every night at the same time. At first it scared me, but now it's driving me crazy, she confided. What happens at that time? The old woman asked, glancing at her. Tracy looked away. You won't say, chuckled the old woman. Okay, don't speak. But if you want to sleep, you must bury your past. How? Tracy asked, frightened. The old woman tasted the soup, smacking her lips in approval. There's a ritual. Take things that are connected to your thoughts and trouble your soul. If your groom left you at the altar, take the ring he gave you. If you don't have anything, then the pages you've poured your soul out onto will do. Paper, as you know, takes everything. The old woman looked at the guest so attentively that Tracy involuntarily shuddered. She pictured her diary in her backpack. No, the fortune teller couldn't have known about the notebook, but for some reason, Tracy felt otherwise. Shivers ran down her spine. What should I do then? Tracy asked, trying not to tremble under the old woman's gaze. Go to the cemetery after midnight. The old woman nodded towards the window, where crosses could be seen. Bury the things and sprinkle them with cemetery earth, and say goodbye to your past. Then it will let go of you. Go alone, leave your friend at home. But there's one important part. You can't bury it just anywhere. You have to go where the old graves are. You'll know where you need to go. Your feet will lead you. When you find the abandoned, overgrown grave, stop there to bury the past. Tracy paid the fortune teller in groats and canned food for such unusual advice. She went out to her friend who was cracking seeds by the fence and impatiently looking towards the house. Well, what's there? Viola asked, burning with curiosity. Tracy shrugged, regretting that she had refused the help of a psychotherapist. On the other hand, he wouldn't have taken buckwheat with rice for a session. Tracy told everything to Viola. She listened carefully, nodding enthusiastically. Let's go today, okay? Where? Tracy was surprised. To the cemetery, at night. I already have nightmares. Maybe that's enough for me. Come on, where's your praised scepticism? Don't be afraid, I'll go with you. You can't, I have to go alone. Tracy sighed. When the stars scattered across the sky, Tracy gathered her courage and went to the cemetery. All the way, she grumbled to herself that she was doing something stupid. You, Tracy, are studying to be a biologist. You're almost 20 and you're doing stupid things. Go back home better. Despite her grumbling, Tracy entered the land of the dead. There she walked forward, turned a couple of times and didn't notice how she ended up in the forest. In front of her was an old grave overgrown with grass. A sad marble angel leaned over it. Tracy involuntarily remembered the old woman's words, that her feet would lead her to the right grave. The girl shuddered, either from the cold or from horror. She took out her diary and a small shovel borrowed from Viola's grandmother's garden. Digging up the ground, she put her past in the pit and covered it with earth. When Tracy returned home, Viola was already snoring. The girl, after washing up, fell onto her assigned spot and fell asleep without a bad dream. Tracy didn't know what exactly caused her long sleep. Maybe it was the rural air, sweet and fragrant with herbs, or the fact that she was tired during the day. Or maybe it was because she buried her past, as the fortune teller advised her. However, when she opened her eyes, the sun was high. The villagers had long been awake, and the aroma of fried pancakes was coming from the kitchen. Tracy almost burst into tears, realising that she hadn't woke up at three in the morning. 
she decided she wouldn't look for the reason. She was just happy that she rested. Seven years had passed since that strange but life-changing trip to the village for Tracy. She graduated from college and worked for a pharmaceutical company. Recently, Tracy got married. Her husband, Paul, was an entrepreneur. She already spoke with friends from youth. Adult life separated them into families and work offices. Viola became a successful actress. Michael, with whom Tracy was dating at the time, but broke up because of a dark secret, owned a chain of cafes. Brian led a quiet life. He was a family man and a military man. The man had two sons. And then one day, the group of friends reunited, but the occasion was not a happy one. They all gathered at Viola's apartment. She threw a letter on the table. Did anyone else receive such a letter? The actress frowned. They're blackmailing me, like in the stupid horror movie. I know what you did last summer. They're threatening to sell information to journalists, drain the lake and ruin my career. I got one too. Michael nodded grimly. They're demanding a lot of money for their silence. I didn't get one, Brian said, surprised, and then laughing. But I don't have any money either. However, seeing the tense faces of his old friends, he felt embarrassed. I didn't get one either, Tracy confessed. But who could have known about our past? That's what we need to figure out, Viola said, sitting down and crossing her legs. She looked worried and frightened. She did not want to move from the society columns to criminal reports. We need to find out who could have known about the incident, Michael said. Did any of you tell anyone? Your spouse, lovers, I don't know, the priest in confession? Everyone shook their heads in denial. Tracy bit her lips thinking about the question. She had never talked to her husband about it, but Paul knew she had a secret that tormented her. Yes, she had gotten rid of insomnia and nightmares, but they sometimes returned, especially when triggers appeared in her life. Once, after another attack, she even joked that it was time for her to go to the grave with the angel again. Her husband then listened to her crazy story with interest. Remembering it now, Tracy thought about her diary. She still kept diaries because they helped her calm down and served as a form of therapy. I, Tracy, was going to tell about her husband, but changed her mind about involving him. I didn't tell anyone, except, do you remember, Viola, that I buried my diary? Well, in the village where your grandparents lived. If someone found it, do you remember, Viola, that I buried my diary? Well, in the village where your grandparents lived. If someone found it, they could find out the truth. But only you and I knew about the diary and its contents. And maybe the fortune teller, of course. Do you think she dug up the grave and decided to blackmail us? Viola snorted. Like, I'll take the money and go to Las Vegas Casino for the last time. Tracy shrugged, but Brian did not dismiss this version. We need to check, the military man said. Let's be safe while we have no other versions. It was decided that Tracy and Michael would go to Green River Village while Viola and Brian stayed in the city. The girl thought she wouldn't find her way to the right grave. However, she came to the same tombstone at the edge of the cemetery in the forest. A sad angel stood over the grave. Tracy dug up the soil but found nothing. The girl became cold and sat on the ground. It's my fault. I don't know how, but someone found out about the diary. And how could the paper have survived at all? They recently dug up a newspaper that was 70 years old, Michael said sadly. And don't blame yourself. We got into this mess together, and we'll get out of it together. That sounds like a phrase from some blockbuster, the girl laughed. Michael smiled too and extended his hand to help her up from the damp soil. They wanted to go back since the sun was already setting. But suddenly they heard screams from under the ground, then strong muffled blows as if someone were pounding on the lid of a coffin from the inside. 
Tracy and Michael looked at each other. Fear and shock reflected on their faces. They didn't believe what they were hearing. Please tell me I'm hallucinating. And you don't hear someone trying to get out of the grave, Michael whispered. Then I'm hallucinating too, a pale Tracy muttered. Help! They heard a voice from under the layer of cemetery soil. People, help! The voice was muffled and the words were hard to make out, but the message was clear. Michael went to the voice and Tracy, frightened, followed him. Look, the soil here is very loose, the young man said when they arrived. Michael and Tracy began to remove the soil with their shovels. Layer by layer, they dug up the grave. The voice from under the ground did not stop asking for help. Fortunately, the coffin was not buried deep, so the friends reached it quickly. They cleared the ground and opened the lid. Soil fell on the man who was lying inside. He was alive, only scared. After spitting out the soil and rubbing his eyes, the man rushed towards Tracy and Michael. He did it so fiercely that Tracy screaming fell to the ground and covered her face with her hands. Michael, on the other hand, aggressively intervened between her and the unknown person they saved from the grave. Damn it, don't be afraid. Let me hug you. The man chuckled in a bass voice. He pulled Michael and then Tracy, who were both surprised, towards him. He gave them suffocating bear hugs and kissed them firmly on the cheeks. He laughed, thanking his rescuers. From the bottom of my heart, guys, from the bottom of my heart, you, you two saved me. This place is so remote. No one would have found me here. My so-called buddies buried me alive. Can you believe it? We didn't agree on something. He moaned, and then like a genie released from a magic lamp, began promising to fulfill any cherished desires. What do you want? Money? A car? Maybe you have enemies. So... I can bury them right here on the spot. Tracy shook her head in horror, but Michael suddenly became happy. Listen, someone is blackmailing me. I have no idea who it is. I can't go to the police. Can you find out who it is? The man scratched his chin and nodded. For you, I'll dig them up from under the ground. Then he paused and laughed again. Got it, from under the ground, just like you saved me. The new acquaintance turned out to be a powerful bandit named Rick, but he was a very cheerful and charming bandit, and he kept his promise. They set a trap for the blackmailer. They put the money in a bag and left it under a bench in the park, but the blackmailer couldn't get far. Rick's friends were standing at each park exit. They quickly caught the person with the coveted burden. The bandits took him to the garage and ordered him to confess, threatening to deprive him of his manicure with pliers. They also convinced the wretched criminal to forget about extortion. Only after that did Rick invite his new friends to his estate, and then the identity of the blackmailer made everybody gasp, especially Tracy. Paul? The girl was astonished, looking at her battered spouse. But how? Why? Paul, with a broken face and a frightened gaze, looked at his wife. He didn't answer. And then Rick explained the situation instead of him. Your husband has big problems with his business. He's in debt, so he wanted to make money off your friends. Then he planned to run away with his mistress. He even bought tickets to Cuba. Can you imagine? With whom? Tracy was even more surprised. Yes, he has an accomplice. His secretary, Anna. I'll introduce you to her too. She's a clever girl and she promised to keep quiet. Just not to see me at her house again. Rick laughed. And about your skeletons in the closet, guys. They found out because Tracy had nightmares at night. Her husband overheard what you said, Tracy. He took things from the cemetery, knowing which grave had an angel. Then he poked his nose into your diaries. Tracy was horrified. She trusted her husband and thought he loved her. She never told him the whole truth, only bits and pieces. But 
she never thought Paul would use it against her friends. However, these were not all surprises from Rick. Oh, what a fool I am. I haven't told you the most important thing yet. This scumbag, he poked Paul's shin with the toe of his shoe, offered to share with us the money and told us what he had read in the diary. The quartet of friends looked at each other in horror and the bandit shook his head. No, don't worry, the man smiled. I conducted my own investigation. The case is closed. No one will ever think of you. And you had been worrying about nothing. The police were already looking for those three who went to the bottom of the lake. They committed many crimes before meeting you. So you're not criminals. Your justice caught up with them. Tracy didn't believe the man's words. She had been carrying a burden on her heart for almost ten years, and it wasn't easy to get rid of it. The girl's head was spinning, and Michael picked her up. The events of her youth were resurrected in her mind as a familiar nightmare. Tracy was nineteen. She had just finished her exams, so she went to the lake with her friends and her boyfriend, Michael. The students set up tents, made a fire, and took out the guitar. Only their peace was disturbed by uninvited guests. A car pulled up to the lake. Two guys and a girl got out of it. Oh, our spot is taken, the blonde in a leather jacket pouted. Guys, won't you give us a place by the fire? We know how to be grateful, the brunette man asked and brought a whole box of beer. Friends looked at each other and decided it would be more fun together. The carefree students were open to meeting new people. At first, everything was going great. Tracy remembered a lot of laughter, like when the guys undressed to their underwear and, with the girls' eyes closed, jumped into the lake at night. She also remembered how Michael played the guitar. But at some point, the picture began to blur. Tracy felt sick. When she tried to get up, she almost fell into the fire. One of the guests caught her just in time and whispered into her ear, laughing, Shh, you drank too much, little fish. Even through the haze, Tracy understood that something bad was happening. The man's hand slid from her waist down. The girl pushed him away with her hands. He stepped away but kept laughing. Tracy remembered that she drank only a little wine and couldn't have gotten into such a state. She took two uneven steps towards the tent but fell again. Before passing out, the girl heard Michael scream. When Tracy opened her eyes again, she realized she was in a car. She was sitting in the front seat and Michael was driving on a bumpy road at such a speed as if they were being chased. Before she could ask anything, she heard a honk from behind. Michael clenched his jaw and pressed the gas pedal harder. What's going on? Tracy whispered, turning to Viola and Brian. Her friend was pale, with tears streaming down her cheeks. We had the misfortune to get involved with some psychos, Brian explained, anxiously looking back at the car that was following them. They spiked our drinks with something, but Michael didn't drink, so we managed to escape and they didn't expect him to be a boxer. He knocked them both out, and then I came to my senses. You and Viola lost consciousness right away. He put his fingers in my mouth, and I threw up, and then I came to my senses. But why? Tracy gasped. Maybe they wanted to rob us, maybe something worse. Brian shrugged, holding Viola, who was crying harder. He didn't want to scare them even more by revealing the guy's nasty plans for the girls. It's okay. The road will turn right soon and there's a city there. We'll break away, Michael said confidently. But it seemed like the pursuers had the same idea. Their car rushed forward and began to ram Michael's car. The girls screamed when the car shook. Behind them, the other car honked away, playing some lively mocking tune. The car caught up with them, trying to push the students towards the cliff and into the deep lake. However, Michael suddenly hit the brakes and put the car in reverse. Tracy hit the dashboard when it happened. When she opened her eyes, she realized their car was standing still. 
the girl looked at her boyfriend in fear. Michael, why aren't we moving? Tracy asked, following Michael's gaze. She gasped and covered her mouth with her hands. The pursuer's car was slowly sinking into the lake. They wanted to crash into the student's car, but when Michael backed up, they fell off the cliff at full speed. Should we call the police? Are they alive? Viola asked, frightened. Everyone was looking at the lake, surrounded by the nighttime forest. However, there were no sounds or signs of life. Let's go, Michael said flatly. What? But there are people there, Tracy was frightened. We have an underage drunk teenager in the car, Michael nodded at Brian. I don't know what they'll find in our blood. And no, I don't trust the police, who just need to close the case. I don't want to spend the rest of my life behind bars because I saved us from some jerks. The car moved. Tracy looked at the control panel. It was three o'clock in the morning and 15 minutes. The students watched news broadcasts for a long time, waiting for someone to retrieve the car from the bottom of the lake. However, time passed and it didn't happen. No matter how hard the guys tried to justify themselves, it became difficult for them to live. Tracy, the most sensitive of the group, constantly imagined what a terrible end would befall that trio. However, new details from Rick helped her heart find some peace. Anyway, the car was stolen, he reported. They killed the owners. The news didn't talk about it because one of the guys was the son of a local politician. He was constantly covering up for his offspring and in the end, he crossed all boundaries. All three of them had damaged their minds due to substances. So, I'm even afraid to imagine what they wanted to do to you. And the deceased's father was looking for you, by the way. It's a miracle he didn't find you, or you'd be in trouble. But now, he's also in another world. So, you have nothing else to fear. They discussed the past and everything Rick had managed to find out for a long time. With each new word, Tracy calmed down. But there were still many difficulties ahead, such as divorce from her husband. However, there was also a lot of good. After all, Michael was hugging and comforting her now. Viola and Brian were together again. Tracy was sitting in the arms of her student love, and suddenly she realized that there was nothing obvious in this world. A bandit can become your friend. A loved one can become an enemy. A cemetery can bring relief and other surprises. And the past, even the gloomy one, can come back into your life and turn into a bright future. She believed in it. <laughs>